Welcome to day two of uh, submissions on our annual plan. Um, we have had uh, an apology from Councillor Hall, an apology for lateness from Councillor Newell. So I'll move that those be... And, the, and the, well, the Mayor's already in. Yeah. So I'll move that we accept those apologies. Seconded, Councillor Lord. All in favour? Aye. Carried. All right, on to our first submitter for the day. Welcome, Dougal. You are. <laughs> <clears throat> So good morning everyone and thank you for allowing us the time to speak here today. Um, I'm going to take uh, the submission as read um, but probably just highlight uh, a couple of points within there uh, if that's okay with people here and then i um, happy to take as many questions at the end um, as, as you like. Um, we congratulate the council on uh, the process that it's going through and that it is looking to engage at a much um, higher and deeper level across a number of facets throughout the council. So we congratulate Sue and her leadership team for getting out into the community to try to articulate all of that work that's out there. Uh, we see that in the proposed rates rise is uh, 5%, so that's uh, higher than, um, than what was expected or what was planned at 4.5. Um, and we'd just like to urge a bit of caution about that because we are aware that there are a number of projects outside of that figure already that have been uh, put to council yesterday and more to come in the future and what that effect on that number might actually be and how that would affect both uh, households uh, and business uh, throughout the city uh, because there are other rises as well when we know that we know for example uh, regional council rates are going up but also the cost of living and things like that. Uh, we're really um, aware about the with, with the, the, the growth that we've had the impact that has on the city um, and particularly the work that's going to come up around the, um, the main arterial routes, but of course also the centre city upgrade. Uh, what we do encourage there is the continued um, good and deep consultation on that, but also a cognizance and awareness of the effect that that will have on the productivity um, when we're planning those things, but also um, how that will affect uh, parking and people's accessibility to uh, different parts of the city and what we can do to alleviate that and and we stress that we'd really like to see a, a strong collaboration with all those other parties in TA, the Otago Regional Council about what that's going to look like and how we manage that so we can decrease the impact on people's lives and incomes during that time. Uh, so as I say that includes looking at the parking um, and what those effects are. Uh, equally ties into that quite closely is um, the centre city bus loop. Uh, we support that but would be really like to know a little bit more about that, particularly the numbers and the costs around that, understanding what that looks like and a more detailed understanding about what that route might look like and then actually planning that around what's going to happen with the main arterial route and the city centre upgrade so that we don't do things twice um, and that that's well articulated. Um, some other things there, uh, there's been some conversations about marketing, we're really pleased um, that the, the review has happened with um, Enterprise Dunedin and there are some good findings out of there and we think that there's some good progress made already. Uh, we're aware that um, there is a process underway at the moment to appoint a new marketing person so we look forward to that and that's involved some good community consultation there. Um, so uh, I think there is a, a role when that person is in place to be able to actually have a look at the data in some depth and get some analysis, uh, uh, particularly around spend and what that looks like. And I think we need to be really aware about um, where, what is our capacity, what is the maximum we can cope with, because we know on some days we're not coping at the moment. Uh, we can't get people to attractions and things like that. So we need to have a look at our, our ebbs and flows and know that data pretty well. Um, again, we're also interested in making sure that uh, we continue to work with the council around the living wage for contractors and for staff, uh, understanding what those numbers look like and mean uh, for the city and the rates and for the workers and for the contractors is really important to our businesses so that they understand that tendering process pretty well when they go for it. Um, so that'll be pretty important for us. 
Uh, just another bit around the centre city rebuild. Um, we, we would urge at this stage until we know what the numbers actually are, so uh, whether there's going to be a re-costing a, a re of the main street. It was done several years ago. I think the option was 60 million. What does that actually look like now? What is the actual number now? Um, so we get an up updated on the budget about what that might look like. Um, but also, to, we just urge caution to talk about um, around the talking of targeted rates um, and the fact that leading into that project where we know that there's decreased um, foot traffic, uh, there's decreased potential uptake uh, in the shops, uh, that that may put some businesses off in the meantime going into that area uh, before that work is done. Um, so we just urge that that doesn't happen um, as, as probably loudly as what could be done until we know the actual numbers and what the detail behind that actually is, um, and so that we then we can understand that a whole lot better as we go through. Um, so that would be um, great, but we really appreciate the engagement and the connection that has happened with that. Um, we're looking to try to support as much engagement as we can so we can make informed decision making about what's going to be best for that whole sector that sits in there. Thank you very much. Happy to take as many as you like. I just wanted to ask you a wee bit, um, just thinking about the centre city plan and the, your comments about be careful around the targeted rates. Um, I'm sort of as a person that received a lot of targeted rates over my life in the years, I, I sort of actually think they're quite a good idea, but, um, but I'm willing to listen and have the debate. But do you think that there will, benefit, uh, there will be benefits to those um, people that own the buildings, for example, up the centre city, that would be the um, receiver of those targeted rates that would not outweigh the... Got an opinion about that? Yes, yeah, so the first thing is we need to know the detail about what the cost of that targeted rate actually would be. So we're not saying we're for and against because we don't have the information yet that actually tells us what that's going to be. Uh, there's no doubt that um, an area which receives some of that revitalisation um, can benefit from it, but they also have been paying rates on that uh, section of the road and footpath for some period of time. Without a doubt, there needs to be the pipe work done. That cannot be, you know, that has to be done so it makes sense to do it together. I think we just need to continue the conversation about what that is going to look like. But we also know that in the present time when they're going to be reducing their income, as we've seen with other projects around the city lately, that can be quite a devastating effect and may cause some businesses to close. So I think we just need to keep uh, quite a close conversation about what that looks like before um, getting emotional about what that actually looks like. Yeah, OK. The other, the other question I've got is really around, around sorry, pedestrianisation and slow streets and those sorts of things. We've had um, significant, I, I would say significant, there have been people ask us about pedestrianisation and, and slower streets and more mm. open areas, you know, the type of things you see in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane and those places. And I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts about how we should tackle that? Because I, I'm I'm not against the idea, I just, I'm, I'm seeking advice. I want mm. to know that if we do those things, we're not going to suddenly drive people away from those areas. And um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I think one of the key aspects to the consultation so far is trying to continue to make our main street a destination within itself. So having reasons for people to go there, uh, for families and for shoppers, so it's more than just about retail. It's got to be more than that. But with them, we've got to understand what that looks like for logistics, for parking, for disability parking, for getting goods and services to those areas. So we need to understand all those and have all of those parts in the mix. Um, what we have to manage most importantly is while that work is being done is how do we still create an environment where we create it as an attraction for people to attend even though those sections of the street may be disrupted so we create either events or we create other ways for people to access that quite quickly so it doesn't put them off because what we do know uh, is that when people have the opportunity to change their behaviours, sometimes they never go back to their original behaviours or, or preferences. So we want to minimise the disruption to that change uh, by creating events or, or activities that will continue to draw um, groups in. Because what we do know is that our main street is still quite different to most other places throughout the country. Retail in Dunedin is actually doing better per, capita, per head of capita than other areas in the country as well. Um, so we want to continue to maintain that um, as we go through things. 
Councillor Vincent Pope. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, just uh, apropos of that question that you, you raised about targeted rates, um, one of the, no decisions made obviously, mm -hmm. but one of the uh, considerations or suggestions in the discussion to date has been that no, if such a rate were levied, if such a decision were, were made, um, it would be desirable not to actually levy it until the com work had been completed. So that would dodge the issue you were talking about in terms of cash flow and disruption. Would that be uh, an approach that you would welcome? Look, I think, it's, I think it's something that needs to be added to the mix of that conversation. I think that sort of discussion, particularly during that disruptive phase, is one that would be much appreciated. I think it's also an understanding about how do we actually apply that rate or that targeted rate is it by square metre of, uh, of frontage that the, that, the, that the property owner has that then passes on to the business? Because remember, it is the property owner that will get targeted that then passes on. So how we, what is the process for actually doing that? What happens to those businesses that are on the eighth floor above that? Uh, we need to understand all of those complexities around it before we can actually then understand what that effect is going to be on each individual property owner and stroke business. So. Um, uh, that's all part of the mix of the conversation that we have to have moving forward. Councillor Vandervis. Thank you. You've mentioned the issue of parking a number of times and uh, I'm sure you've had uh, time to traverse the issue with uh, your members. Um, do your members, do you think, agree with the Mayor's statement which was printed in the uh, Target Daily Times on the 31st of October last year that council should set a goal of reducing car parks each year because of the benefits to public health and local businesses a move away from cars would deliver. Do your members agree with that uh, kind of philosophy? Uh, I haven't asked them that specific question. What I do know for many of our members is that um, a, a direct access to um, car parking close to their business has been in the past seen to be beneficial. Um, so in other words, that they may get more uh, people going into their shop, potentially. It's about how we manage some of that parking as well. What is our turnover rate? So that's a really important part because for some of those streets, we don't want people um, parking there for half a day, a day. Or for example, on Sundays when there's free parking and the staff go and park their cars there because it's nice and close. So we've got to have that management side of it as well. What we do know is that the population is increasing within the city. Uh, we know we haven't had that mode shift away from personal vehicles where the majority of people are still driving one person to a vehicle and they're going to have to park somewhere. Um, and we're seeing pressures elsewhere throughout the city uh, where they're trying to, like if we look down at the harbour side for example, there are many businesses that are finding it hard to get uh, their transport, their transporters to be able to get close to their businesses so they can get goods on and off because there are a number of people parking in what can be their sites or, or had been what they thought were theirs, but they're not, they're public. Have you had any feedback regarding uh, parking for staff? You just mentioned staff um, parking in George Street on a Sunday. Mm. Um, do you uh, anticipate a, a, a worsening problem if those parks are not available anymore? And where do you think commuter mm. uh, parking should go, given that we're getting less of it currently? Yeah, it was really interesting. There was um, a strong debate, I'm not sure whether people saw it this morning, on the AM show around um, large cities and smaller cities and how we're comparing to Australia with infrastructure and transport, and uh, Australia particularly in its mid-cities uh, 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 I suppose creating more accessibility and spending uh, per capita a whole lot more on their transport systems and a better uptake. One of the big issues we need to get across, I believe, as a city is how do we start to think about our transport system and how do we get a mode shift. Uh, we don't want to decrease that productivity by being stuck in traffic as we're starting to see now, but we know that that is going to take some time. Uh, that transition is going to take some time, but we have to lead that and lead it strongly but there is still going to be a need for individual parking for cars, both for visitors and or for workers. Um, and how do we actually accommodate for both of those without affecting the other bits that are going on? So I think there is a whole piece of work that needs to be done around, uh, particularly when we, you know, with the hospital rebuild, there's going to be a significant effect with that, that one-way system. How's that going to impact? Where are people going to go? 
how do we start to get some of that shift that starts to happen? Because we have seen already, you know, in the last year with the amount of road which we've had, the significant impact that happens on traffic flow. Um, so how can we manage some of that and lead some of that into a new space? Thank you. And finally, you, you mentioned uh, productivity uh, being affected uh, adversely by congestion. Uh, do you have anything other than sort of anecdotal evidence of that? Is there any uh, part of your organisation that actually looks at productivity and looks at the effects, for instance, of spending a lot more time in traffic jams? Yeah, uh, what, what we do know is that the, the, tr the, the um, I suppose, the transportation time for people going to work and coming back from work has increased, particularly in that very small time frame that we have around that five o'clock. I think now people are starting to look at how and when they work and doing that a little bit differently so they are least impacted as they can. Uh, yes, it does affect productivity. Um, you know, I can give one example of myself. I had a meeting at the university and usually it takes me five minutes to get back to my office. Uh, one day it took me 35 minutes because all of the one-way systems, uh, they had works on them. There was work down at the, um, by the railway station and everything got clogged up. Now that is an effect that happens because if you think about that for, let's say, those truck drivers or those transport people, uh, they're on limited hours with their, with their licences of course and that can have an impact on that distribution chain that goes through. Um, I think you know, with the change that could happen with the hospital, understanding what the parking is going to look like for that, how do we create guaranteed parking for those um, um, I suppose uh, people who are going in there for services so that it might be um, automated drivers or it might be um, a certain type of uh, shared driving service where they might be electric where they get a guaranteed park. So they happen in Christchurch now. That could be part of a solution to reduce some of that stuff or get that so people know exactly where they're going so they're not driving around four or five times around the block. But there's a, there's a whole lot that sits in there but we, we do know that if you're in traffic longer uh, it's going to decrease the productivity and we know that we pride ourselves on being a 10 minute city. Uh, you know, I think we're probably now a 12 minute city. Right, so you know that it has an effect but you, you don't actually have any quantifiable data. On I, that. I haven't got the, the dollar figure that would sit beside it now but I'm sure that there'd be some there that we could put into place. Yep. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you Dougal. I've got two questions, one's transport and the other one's consultation. So I'll start with the transport because it sort of follows in. Do you agree then that as we're going forward, there appears to be an increased use of single vehicle movements and that's causing and it's coming with um, slowing down of the ability to move through the city and that whenever we get a works, like the closing of the bridge at Dundas Street or any work on the one-way system, mm -hmm. we're starting to see quite significant increases in um, travel time? Yeah, so I think, uh, so, so to the first part of that question about increased use, I think there are more people that live in Dunedin, therefore we have more cars on the road. So I don't know whether there's increased use by the same number of people, but there are more people on the road. So yes, there is. Um, I suppose the, the impact is quite significant. So another one that was quite recently, we had Stewart Street being redone, and then we had the other two main arterial routes going over the hill. All three of them were being done at once, and the traffic snailed up right through the city. Um, and so there's those sort of effects that go through with that, that side of things too. So you've got two factors there, increased uh, number of people in the city bringing cars, and then we have the infrastructure needs which we know are so important to be developed, like it might be the drainage, it might be the piping, all those sorts of things. Yes, so it would come as no surprise to you that an NZTA audit found almost 40,000 car movements come through the Oval every day and over 15,000 come down Portsmouth Drive now every day. Yeah, but, and very few of my understanding of those ones that come from south, very few of them actually, I think there's only about 10 or 15 per cent actually go right through the city or might be less yeah, than that, go right through the city out the other end. So we need to understand those flows, which has been some really good work done by NZTA, and then it's understanding what that actually looks like, because the same is happening from the north where they're coming in from the north but they're not going out through the south. So we need to understand those flows because what we can see is people are coming in and then obviously going back out at the end of the day. So we need to make sure that we understand those and how, that, how we can alleviate some of that. And then acknowledging that as we go forward with all of the projects that we're going, we're going to change all those flows. And I guess you touched on it. Do you think then that, um, especially for the commute, especially for workers, that we're going to have to start addressing a mechanism of getting people into the city that's not necessarily just based on an individual driving, an individual car coming in? 
No, it's going to be a mixed use. There has to be a mixed use model, that's for sure. Um, and you know, there, there's got to be solutions around that that last kilometre of, of the journey. What that actually looks like. Um, yeah, it'd be great if we can increase the people, uh, the chance that they're walking, things like that. Equally with tourists, you know, we, we we continually, uh, you know, if a tourist says to us, and if, let's say they're from America, and they say, oh, you know, how far away is the Octagon? And we say two blocks. Now for us, that's six minutes walk, but two blocks to an American is half an hour. So there's a different terminology and understanding what that actually means when we start talking to people in those sorts of ways. So therefore they are more likely to try to get a taxi or a bus or something like that. Either way, it's adding to that. When walking can be a solution. You know, that's one of the conversations we're having about the hospital. And particularly when we have those 750 workers on site, how are we actually going to get all of them to site every day? Right? Because they're going to have tools, they're going to have all those things that they've got to take with them. How do we actually get them safely to site, but also so that it doesn't affect the other people who are travelling? Equally with the logging trucks, we know there's going to be a massive increase in logging in the next five years. What is the route for that for our city to keep our pedestrians and our workers safe? And what does that actually look like? And then what effect is that having on our other roads apart from the NZTA owned ones and what is the future cost of that to the city. So there's a health and safety cost to people and the community but there's also a dollar cost to what it means to upgrade and keep those roads on the on the go. Cool. So from an annual plan submission and where we're going perspective, there's the connecting to need and um, committee meetings yep. going on now and now there's some governance representation at those committees. Um, would you like to see that activity be where the coordination of all of this could go because this is where NZTA, ORC and DCC sit in the same room. Yeah, it's really, uh, that's going to be a, a massively important piece of work and I was, I was really lucky to be part of the early stages of that and we look forward to continuing to be part of that because it's going to be important for businesses to understand how they are going to get goods and potentially services to their businesses and back out because if there is a major change in those roading, what is that actually going to mean for them for getting accessibility for those large trucks because at the moment where we've designed some of our bigger box retail stores, it's been designed around main, you know, the one-way system and we can get the big freight liners in and out of those okay. facilities. Cool. And now the other one is a consultation question. You mentioned it in your written but you didn't cover it in your um, verbals, the proposed bridge to connect to the harbour side yeah. and consultation and you saying here that there's been no further consultation since it was first announced. What would you like to see between now and the next announcement in terms of consultation? Like, what, what specifics do you want covered? Yeah, look, there's been, obviously there's been a lot of really good work happening behind the scenes, particularly around the Provincial Growth Fund application and things like that. I think um, making sure that those businesses in the immediate and surrounding area understand what those conversations are about and what the effects on them could be. Equally, equally we know that the last time there was some work done on, on the Jetty Street uh, overbridge, that um, it's, it sounds silly, but the, you know, we've got a whole shunting yard that's happening under, underneath that area, which is continually working. And there are workers who are in those trains and working around that shunting yard. And last time I understand that there was a near incident during that time where something fell off the bridge as it was being re repaired at all. And it went through the cabin of one of the, one of the, 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 the um, people who are working there. So we need to understand that so that people can plan ahead and understand, but also they can contribute some of their good ideas because they live and work there every day. So I'd encourage people to understand that, but also know what the time frame of what that build could be so that they can plan around that and ask them for any of their thoughts or ideas. So one aspect would be you would like the consultation to be done in such a way that before something has gone too far and can't be reversed, there's been a question on what, what do you think about this so that it can be some... Yeah, just, just keep people informed um, because that's really important and um, because then they understand and then they can raise those questions as and when they need and want to. Uh, but also they understand what they're planning for and what that's going to look like. And that's both on this side because we have very few east-west corridors within the city uh, and it's really important that we understand how that effect is going to go on for the city. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by your submission on the living wage, and I just want to under, uh, pull that out a bit. And you, you've submitted on concerns about it in the past, and I just want to reflect the economic development strategy and see whether the chamber is still with it, where it's um, the goals of the economic development strategy. The second one is an average of 10,000 extra income for each person re requiring GDP per capita to rise by about 
2.5 per cent per annum. Are you still holding that that's something we should be aiming for? Yeah, ab absolutely it is. And, and we've, we've never come out and said that we're against the living wage either. And, and I've continually said that here. We, we support that. But what we need to understand is how are businesses going to get there to understand what that looks like. So it can't just happen straight away. They need to have a plan and a process and they need to understand what that looks like. At a time when all the data that's coming out from ours and national and regional um, surveys are saying that future profitability is at its lowest level for some considerable time. So it's about managing all of those and putting a correct time frame so businesses can adapt and increase their productivity and do those aspects so that then it can be rewarded without businesses going broke. I, I get, and, and that's great, um, and I get all of that, but surely as a Chamber of Commerce, when you're the lowest paid generally spend all of their, 100% of their wages in the local economy, I think that's how it works, especially when you've acknowledged the, town, the city's getting busier with more people and therefore, and we, we discussed it yesterday, the housing um, position is that rents are getting higher. That I'm, I'm intrigued that that's um, the thing that you've targeted, and maybe it's because we mentioned it in the annual plan, rather than, I, I hope you're taking the bigger picture that companies shouldn't be paying high director fees as well, because that's, it, that's part of the same I think, I think what we are saying here is we want to be part of the discussion about what the effect on the ratepayer will be for having a living wage. It's not about whether the living wage is right or wrong. We just understand, we just want to understand what that cost is to the ratepayer. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. We're not entering into that debate. What we are saying is what is the cost effect to the ratepayer? Would you see that it would be a, if, it, if, if it, I think I'm correct, that they generally spend 100% of their pay in the local economy, would that be a good thing for the um, chamber businesses generally? Well, listen, there's a whole lot at of that, elements. At that end. Look, there's a whole lot of elements to this around, you know, what, and there's all sorts of research when you read the articles about what that effect has on inflation, what that has on business, where, yes, people say they go and spend more in the cafes, but the cafes are then charging $8 for a coffee instead of $3.50 to be able to cover it. We have seen anecdotal evidence when these things have gone up, is that there are a decrease in the number of hours worked by part-time staff, mm. right, because of the cost going up. You would have known that with your cafe that you ran sometimes, that gets quite tough. Um, and, you know, these are all factors. It's not just as simple as, as saying that because this is going to happen that there's going to be more money spent because we don't actually know that. It could be, for example, you know, when we have a targeted rate on the centre city businesses, if that goes ahead, what is the cost on that to council? Because council owns a considerable amount of real estate in that area. So what is the dollar value that is going to affect the council of that decision? And what is that going to be? Is that going to be charged to rates? Or does that go straight towards the people who are in those businesses that are running within those environments? So those are the things that we need to understand. Councillor Wiley. Um, Dougal, you made mention of the Martin Jenkins report and uh, the significant growth visitor sector uh, of the city's economy. Um, how are we progressing in that in, in the view of the um, Chamber of Commerce? Mm. Um, look, there's, uh, the, the, it was great that a number of people had the opportunity to voice their opinion. Um, now we've got a some decisions that have to be made out of that, and there's been some plans put together to try to move that stuff forward, uh, particularly around some of the data collection and understanding of the data, but also around some of that destination. So, uh, you know, there's a, a, a position which is, so the job description has been collaboratively put together. Uh, there's a panel has been selected in, around the destination manager. So there's some, uh, there's some positives there. Uh, you know, there's, if I was to say something, I think there's probably that that team could do with a little bit more resourcing, it's particularly during this phase where they're going to uh, be putting some plans into place. There's a lot of work being done in that space. There's a lot more connectedness trying to happen. But I think once we get that destination person in there and we get the right person, we hopefully that will drive and stimulate some of the growth that we need. But I think, going back to your point, is we need to understand in detail what the data actually means around international visitors and domestic visitors. One of the issues we face within New Zealand is the cost of travel within New Zealand is actually very high. Uh, there was an example given uh, last about three months ago, uh, they did an analysis of uh, an Auckland family going to the west coast to go for a helicopter ride up to the glaciers. 
or going to Melbourne and going for a helicopter ride over Melbourne. It was cheaper to fly to Melbourne and do that same trip than to travel in New Zealand. So we have a pricing issue uh, within New Zealand which is starting to put people off, uh, both domestically and internationally, because of the quality of what we can and don't offer. But it's also about people come to New Zealand because they want to meet New Zealanders, right? And that's where we have a great opportunity in this town because we are different to some of those major destination areas because you will still meet and talk and mingle with New Zealanders and that's probably one of our greatest assets. And I think there's some great work starting to happen with the Regional Economic Development Plan which could lead to some uh, shared vision about what that destination actually looks like for our whole region to get them in to stay longer in our whole region because that's a benefit to the city and what that's going to look like. So how do we attract people, not just to Dunedin, but to our, our feeder areas? Uh, so just to follow up on that, then you also, uh, there's a comment about investing more in the city marketing, dollar-wise. Yeah, look, and I think, um, I think there's an opportunity that we could uh, look, uh, we could do that, and I think there are always, plenty. I think what we need to understand is what are we actually trying to target? Because we don't want to be targeting those days or those times where we've got 6,000 visitors coming in off a boat because we can't get them to the places already. So it's about those shoulder seasons, it's about understanding where our ebbs and flows are. It's about targeting things like our conferencing and working with the university. So I think understanding that whole picture and what Terry and his team are doing out at the stadium, how does all that mix fit together to understand and then we start to say, right, well, how are we going to start to market the stuff? And that may require more money at that stage. And how do we leverage more from the likes of, you know, Tourism New Zealand? Um, how do we partner with the university and the polytech? All those sorts of elements that go with it. But, um, you know, look, uh, I'd say that you're always competing against everybody else as well. Um, and everybody's spending a lot of money in this space. And what we've got to make sure is that we understand who and what we're trying to deliver to the the domestic market and the international market. Thank you, Dougal. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Appreciate your time. You didn't really run too far over time. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Um, Mr. Mr. McGowan, uh, you, you talked about capacity um, mm. earlier. Uh, and I just wanted to explore that a little bit because we've heard various things through yesterday about capacity um, and it varies from um, organisation to organisation perhaps. Any comments around that? Yeah, look, I mean, it's always going to be difficult when, uh, you know, we're going to have a larger amount of cruise ships, I understand, next year, and that creates, again, um, stresses and strains on infrastructure. So, for example, how many bus drivers do we have? How many buses do we have? How do we actually make sure that that's done safely as well? Um, so there's those constraints that we have from a physical capacity as well as from how do we actually get people in and out. I think what we can see quite clearly is that the city is able to cope with large numbers. Uh, we've seen that over a number of periods of time where, where we have large events. A lot of them come from outside of the city. I think our average is somewhere about 60%. Don't quote me exactly on that, but it's a higher number. Uh, so we have the capacity to do that, but what we could actually do is leverage those times where it's a little bit quieter to try to bring more people in during those times. So you're talking the smoothing the seasonality. Yeah, yeah. yeah continuing you know, to do that. Yeah, yeah uh, without a doubt. And, you know, we've, we've lost a, fe a, mid, uh, a festival that happened during the, the June and July school holidays. Uh, that could have a significant effect on the city and how do we look to grow that space as well and how do we look to make sure that people know that we're still a great place to come during those times. I was just on a plane on Sunday coming, coming down to Dunedin and most of the plane was filled with young people coming to the University Orientation Week, University and Poly Orientation Week, and they had a parent with them, at least one. Now that's a great opportunity for our city to tell people what a great place it is to get them to not only bring their precious children down, but for them to come and visit on more occasions. And we know the effect that the graduations have, with the or orientation week. So how do we continue to grow those sort of aspects? And it was great to see so many bright young faces looking so excited about coming to this place called Dunedin. I was sitting next to a young man who was, um, he uh, got a Pacifica scholarship to come down. The university have, have asked him to come down. 
he was so excited to be here to come and have an opportunity to come and look at somewhere different and uh, I had a great conversation with him on the plane and he was truly excited about being down here for the next three days and looking to make it his place for the next five years so let's hope he does it. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you Chair. Um, great to hear that story. Um, I'm just re um, talking about um, the new marketing person and Norcom Barker um, had a concern that it was tending towards just marketing and not tourism expertise. Have you got any com comment about that? Um, well, yes I do. Um, I've been, uh, I along with others have been part of a group that have put that job description together and they included um, people from the tourism sector. Uh, there were a number of changes made to the original job description as a result of that consultation. Um, and I'm actually sitting on the interview panel. So I think from my and my organisation's perspective, we feel that we've been fully engaged in that. Uh, and now it's up to the org those people who are on that panel to choose the appropriate person or not to appoint and to go back to market, but then to make sure, like with any job, is that people are held accountable for what they are there to deliver. Thank you for that. No more questions, councillors. In that case, Dougal, you are free to go. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Our next submitter is Michelle Reddy. Welcome to the table. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Kiora. I'm Michelle Reddy. And firstly, I'd like to thank the DCC for giving South Dunedin. Uh, the South Needham Community Network, a place-based funding grant. Some of this money has gone into appointing myself as the South Needham Community Facilitator. So in this role, our main co-papa is to make sure that our work and any initiatives that are undertaken in South Needham are community-led, that a variety of different people have been consulted, especially those who do not usually have a voice. We also wish to support South Needham businesses and empower residents to engage fully with their communities. Bearing that in mind, um, I'm here to speak mainly on one issue today. Um, so my submission itself covered a number of topics, including more playgrounds, flooding and accessibility. I know that others are going to be speaking to these topics, so I'd like to talk mainly about cleaning up the main streets, especially King Edward Street. King Edward Street is one of the heart lines for business in South Needham. It is one of the main streets that people think of when they think of South Needham. Um, I think that's my PowerPoint up there. <laughs> I have some photos, if that could be open. Oh, right. I see, I see what I was supposed to do. <laughs> okay, so I've got some photos that I took actually yesterday. Um, and th these are photos from King Edward Street. The gardens are barren at times filled with rubbish, a number of people don't like the street parks. Um, the core fire idea is beautiful, but the rusted grey look really brings the whole area down. Yes, we have gardens, but they don't actually add any value to the street. In fact, many people have been saying that the state of the gardens actually makes the street look worse. And if you see at this photo, there's actually cigarette um, packets and all sorts of cigarette tips and rubbish just floating around. And this is Lawn Street, which is often occupied by kids, young mothers, and literally everyone on all walks of life, from all walks of life. And it's really important to note that public space in South Dunedin is really very overutilized as well, but it's not up to standard. So business owners on <coughs> King Edward Street are especially discouraged. Many of them want to get stuck in and clean up the gardens, but face barriers from council. Business owners also have commented that they feel that South Dunedin's business sector is an afterthought to the DCC, rather than being seen as an asset and worth being invested into. We all know that South Dunedin is key to business overall in Dunedin. There are a number of essential assets that live here. If we don't want to see people fixing up the garden beds by the road, which the DCC has outlined as a health and safety hazard, then a well planned approach to tidying up South Dunedin and upgrading our public space needs to be put into place. I've been working as community facilitator for almost five months, which isn't very long. Um, in this time, we held a community hui with 130 participants. 
I have been talking to a number of diverse groups, and while our community consultation, which we've named Community Conversations, is just kicking off, there are a number of themes already emerging. South Dunedin people want, they want gardens, they want fruit trees, they want plants that they can utilise, they want green spaces, and they want the celebration of the unique history of South Dunedin. They want parks, and most of all people are talking about accessibility. And I believe that these all can be integrated into an exciting project for South Dunedin. I have to emphasise the importance of including local business and a diverse range of people if we are to clean and revitalise the streets of South Dunedin. If we are to replant the gardens and create green spaces, people must feel a sense of ownership and inclusion in order for it to be successful and meaningful to our community. Otherwise, these gardens and public spaces will likely fall into ruin again. If you visit King Edward Street in the middle of the day, it's a bustling hub for people of all walks of life, people with disabilities, people literally living on the street, business owners, kids, people of all socioeconomic backgrounds. Accessibility needs to be considered for everyone. South Dunedin has a spirit of resilience, <coughs> diversity and warmth. South Dunedin has a long history of artistry and creativity. Our people deserve streets that reflect this. So I welcome any comments or questions or insights on how we can best achieve this together. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Kia ora, Michelle. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming. And my question's at a, at a higher level, I guess, and it's around the support for, for place-based groups, for community groups. Mm -hmm. And the intention of that was to try and strike a balance between enabling communities to get on and do the work for themselves, mm. but also supporting them without Absolutely. supporting them without telling them what to do mm. in a paternalistic yeah. fashion. So, do you have any comments to make on how you think that balance has been struck at the moment? I think in South Dunedin, we're really lucky that we have a really good relationship with Rachel Elder, and most workers from DCC want to come in and work with us, which is amazing. I haven't actually seen that in the past with my past job, so that's been really great. So they are. Here to listen but we often get comments like oh we don't actually make the decisions we can listen to you and we can take this back but whether our comments get passed on to a higher level is something that we're not sure about um, so we're not really sure where our work is going at this point so I guess any clarity over that process would be really helpful for us to know that when we talk to council where is that actually going and what is our feedback going to do in the future Thank you, that's really helpful mm -hmm. um, feedback that we can deal with um, mm. separate to this. But do you, do you feel like the community is currently uh, owning that process, the, the process of the work that you're doing, uh, as opposed to being a, a co council community yes. development contractor? Oh, that's really interesting, because when I first entered the job, there was this kind of disapproval of what I was doing. Um, people thought that the DCC were essentially telling us what to do. So it took a lot of community building and me going out and networking to get people to understand that this is very community led, um, really informing them about our plans. And they have come on board. It's taken a lot of um, building of relationships because there is that sense in South Dunedin of distrust towards the DCC. But our, I guess our work is to be that bridge because we really want to work with the DCC. We think that this is amazing, amazing work that you're doing, especially around funding. I know that flooding and I know that that's going to take a lot of time, but it's just communicating to the public about and being really straight up about these issues because they actually don't understand why the flooding, why this and why this hasn't, why that hasn't happened or why hasn't that been fixed yet. So they feel out of the loop. So, but now as we're going forward, I've put to the community that we want to be community led. So we're going to have these series of workshops and I'm actively going out in the community looking for people who haven't been consulted because in South Dunedin, some people have this idea that we've been over consulted. However, it is a very small percentage of people in South Dunedin, mostly stakeholders, but not the people themselves. So when we start asking these questions and building relationships, they are coming on board, they are seeing that we're not there to tell them what to do. And as we do our research and hold these workshops, hopefully we'll come up with a plan that is essentially community led. We haven't directed those 
pathways and to those goals and where we're going to go. So that's where we're at the moment. So we're still relationship building, but it's really exciting times for us. Thank you for doing the work. Appreciate mm. it. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Didn't mean to cover the top of the queue that fast. Um, <clears throat> thanks for your presentation. Um, I just got two questions. One is around that over consultation comment and mm. also um, on King Edward Street itself. Sure. Is it some of the some of the comments that others have made about the over consultation idea mm -hmm. is that they have been talked to and talked and they've yep. talked back a lot and mm -hmm. then haven't really seen much happen. Is that exactly. what they're saying when they're saying over consulted? Um, yes. So they're saying that these questions have been asked already. But what's been done with it? Where is all the feedback from these questions that have been asked to the community? I, by the DCC, but also other groups, like what has happened to that? I've been actively trying to look for that. I haven't found anything, but it would be so useful for us to figure out where the research is, because I know the DCC has worked with South Sneedon, done community consultation, but where is all that information being kept? We don't know what's been done with it. So there is an aspect of that with stakeholders, they feel like they've been asked too many times. But then there's the everyday people who feel like they've never been asked. So it's trying to find that balance. And if we could have the records where people have already been asked, especially stakeholders, then we don't have to go back and ask them and they get really riled up and Or a way of, <laughs> of showing what's come from that consultation mm, mm, so that mm, they mm. can understand where they sit on that process. Yeah. Thanks. And then on the other one, um, would do you think that that in the eyes of investment of infrastructure and, and amenity spends that say King Edward Street from McAndrew Road mm. to Cargill's Corner right. would be sort of like the business retail district of South Dunedin. Yeah. I mean, there's other areas there, yeah, but I mean, yeah, if yeah. you're comparing that to say George Street from Albany Street to the Octagon or Princess mm -hmm. Street from the Octagon down to say Police Street, mm -hmm. would that be sort of the same kind of density of activities? I would say that the space is used differently because there's so many people um, with learning disabilities, um, young mothers and things, people are actually using that space in a different way. They're actually coming in to hang out in the space and be safe. That might be like a safe space for them that they've, they don't have wherever they come from. Um, while the space in, say, George Street is used more as a people come in to shop, and then they leave sort of thing. Well, one South need and it's, it's a very different kind of utility that's going on there. Okay. And I think that could really be invested into and is essential to be invested into because people deserve places that are safe, which I guess the library build is really exciting for us because that will give us a space for all sorts of people to just chill out. But yeah, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So I guess my question is, it's a parity question. Do you think that the amount of money that's going into King Edward Street mm. is the same proportionally in terms of outcomes and community impact as is proposed to go into George and Princess Street? Hmm, that's a... I think it or would you like it? Would I guess my question is, would you like it elevated? To, yes. I, don't, I think the answer to that is it's obviously not because we've got the money budgeted differently. Mm. Would you like King Edward Street to be elevated into the consciousness of the council absolutely. to the same level as those streets? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's essential. Yeah. And it will really help business flourish there. Mm. I mean, you walk down the street, there's so many empty storefronts, but people want shops. People want things that, you know, places where they can actually spend money to an extent where it's actually affordable for them. Because South Needham, I guess the socioeconomic situation is a bit different, but if we have those stores being taken up by, say, artists or other so types of people who don't charge like $100 for a piece of, for a photo or something. You know, like we have to think about what kind of people, what people want out of that area and what they need. Mm. But the city at least can control the streetscape. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. We'd love that. Like, it would just be so amazing to have a, a green space out there because it will be used. It will absolutely be used. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that passionate um, presentation. Um, Lawn Street and um, King Edward Street are really, really busy places. Mm -hmm. Anyone going down there will see that and lots and lots of people hang out yeah. in Lawn Street. So what do you think Lawn Street and the state of Lawn Street and the state of King Edward mm. Street 
tells the people of South Dunedin? Well, if you talk to anyone in South Dunedin and, and the business owners, they feel like they've been left behind. They feel like their business is not important to the city and they feel like they're just, there's this idea in South Dunedin that they're, they're just not part of moving forward in Dunedin, that, that because of the flooding, we're not going to invest any more money there, there's no point, but there's so many people who live there, there's so many people who call that place home. Um, and there's no way that we're all going to move 20,000 people or however many people live there to somewhere else. It's going to be really difficult. So for them, it's like, well, are people giving up on us? Like, is the council literally giving up on us because of this flooding issue? Hmm. You mentioned something else, and that is why people go to the street in South yes. Dunedin. Yeah. And you mentioned that it wasn't just for shopping. No. Um, so why else do people go to, say, Lawn Street, George Street, etc.? Mm -mm. Uh, King Edward Street, sorry. You see um, a lot of people, especially like young mothers, who obviously don't have anywhere else to take their children to playgrounds and things. And playgrounds in South Dunedin aren't really well known or let's say you're a, a young mother and you don't have anywhere to go except you've got a stroller and you can walk. So the, the closest place you're going to go to is probably Lawn Street where there's, it's pretty sad. <laughs> it's, it's pretty sad. What are your kids going to play with? Like those cubes? <laughs> so um, there's that. And there's people with learning disabilities who literally just catch up on the street, hang out on those benches. Um, and they're there all day. Some people have really set routines where they're out on the street and then they go home. And that's, that's their way of living. That's what brings them joy. So that's what we're talking about in terms of the difference that revitalising that space will actually really lift the community. So you're saying that Lawn Street and, and King Edgar Street is actually a, a hangout space yeah. where people meet, socialise and spend mm -hmm. a lot of time. Yeah. Mm. They may not spend as much money as would like, but that doesn't mean that they're not worthy of having a, a beautiful space where they hang out because we can't just say to people with disabilities, well, you don't matter because you don't spend heaps of money down here, like that's not how we probably want society to look like. So yeah, so I think if we were going to raise South Sunedon as a busy, revitalised community, it would be such a great investment. And to also signal to them that, hey, we're thinking about you and you matter. Mm. Cool, thank you. I love seeing the people in Lawn Street, there's so many people there <laughs> yeah, all yeah, the absolutely. time. Councillor Gary. Thank you, thank you Michelle for your uh, presentation. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to marry up your comments and understand your comments in relation to mm -hmm. uh, presentations we've had from Eleanor Doig recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, do you have any comment about that at all? Because she mm. talked about how with the investment we're making in the hub, the yeah. library, uh, that people did feel um, mm -hmm. that we were investing in the area. But I'm hearing something quite different from you. Yeah. Um, so, could you comment on that at all, sure. please? So as we know, it's taken a very long time for that library to happen. And just putting a library there isn't going to automatically solve people's you know, res kind of resentment towards the DCC. I mean, that's, that's a great idea and people are on board, but they're like, oh, you know, you've, built, you've bought the building site. How long is it going to take for this library to actually be there in another sense? Because it's taken 30 years for that to happen. So it's like tangible things like like just revitalising the gardens. Sorry, it's, you yeah. misunderstood my question. My mm. question was, we had a uh, comment from yep. Eleanor, <coughs> who's working in the area, you're working in the area, but the two don't line up. And I'm mm. just wondering, are you talking to different groups? Or? No, Eleanor's my boss. <laughs> right. So she, if she was here, she would also talk about that there has been a bit of uplift from the community library actually going to happen, but there is still need and there is still um, a feeling of we're still being left behind. Right. Because it has, been, it has taken that long and there has been comments like, why would South need a need a library? Um, what would they do there? Do they, are they really deserving? Like, they, these are comments that, were, that, were, that we've heard in the past. And just by saying that we're going to put a library there, is it going to fix that relationship? Uh -huh. Yeah, so we like, a really easy way would be to just to clean up King Edward Street compared to the long term time that it's going to take to put a library there. Well, we don't know how long it's going to take, and we're guessing it's going to take a, a number of years to actually get that running and going. So, mm. Councillor Elder. 
Um, just following on from Kristen Gary's question is, um, do you see a mismatch between the stakeholder groups and NGOs all being involved in that mm -hmm. and the actual community, the people in the community? Mm -hmm. um, and do, do you think that's part of the problem when it comes yes. to perception? Yes, there is a difference between stakeholders and a difference between people who live in South Dunedin and don't necessarily have a voice at those top levels and are going to those high level meetings and can talk to the DCC. Like there is def a, definitely a difference in opinion. And of course there is. I mean, the people who are stakeholders, they are more well off than the people that we're trying to talk to. I mean, the people we're talking to are living day by day. The stakeholders and NGOs, I mean, we're all educated. We all have a good income. We can all survive. But the people of South Dunedin, there are so many people who are just living day to day. And just little things, I think, would really support them in feeling like this community is valued and resourced properly for them. Mm, cool. Mm. Thank you for that. Because, mm. yeah, that, I see that as a bit of a mismatch. Councillor O'Malley. Actually, just want to follow up on that very last comment again. Mm. Do you think perhaps, um, as Council Hawkins suggested, the place-based community groups can fulfil some of those roles? I hope so. Um, because yeah. you lower the barrier mm. effectively to getting involved. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it would just depend on who mm. you've got in these positions, because my own way of working with the community is very much grassroots, intersectional, talk to everyone. But there might be that, that same kind of top-down approach where you're still not getting the people who are actually living in the community having a voice. So I guess for myself, I can say that we are trying our best to approach everyday South Dunedin people rather than NGOs and yeah stakeholders, because they've already been asked. But we would like to figure out where all that information is being kept so we don't have to ask them again. Yeah, there's a logistic. Would you agree there's a logistical issue, and that is that if you try to consult with 10,000 people, mm. you obviously can't put them all in a room and have a, have a no. conversation. So you, you, try, to, to them. you yeah. try to aggregate that, and that's effectively where the stakeholder component mm. comes from. But you've acknowledged that, in fact, mm -hmm. I think I'm hearing that those stakeholders might be very aware of their, uh, the questions they want to bring, but mm -hmm. they don't necessarily refresh with the community? They don't necessarily their, reflect and the therefore, everyday struggle. Yeah. Okay, and, and that's kind of where you guys can step in. Yes, yes, Great. that's where we're trying our best to step in, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for um, having me here. <laughs> awesome. Councillors, I don't think we have our next submitter, um, so I propose that we adjourn the meeting for about uh, probably five or six minutes. Don't go too far away, please. So I'll move that. Seconded, Councillor Vandivis. All in favour? Carried.